thanks for the introduction, Devaka. He knows me too well. That's a problem. So, uh, as he said, like we used to uh, sell uh, our products together, and we travel a lot, and we can write a book about the uh, adventures we had during our travel. And we used to live in the same neighborhood before he moved to uh, Austin, and I moved to Folsom. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so this um, session actually, Sanjeeva gave an uh, introduction to Platformless. So what we thought, um, in, uh, invite a bunch of uh, uh, industry experts and then look at what's the practicality of uh, Platformless concept and uh, discuss about how we can use it in uh, the, uh, our digital journey. So we were working on this concept for a while. Uh, but we didn't have a proper way to introduce this thing. Then Sanjeev and my, myself, we were working on a different um, project, a slide deck, and suddenly this idea came, uh, shall we name it at Platformless? So we jump into that, and then after that, what we did, we wrote a manifesto. So uh, myself, Sanjeev, and then we invited our founding CTO, Paul Fremantle, and we wrote the paper and published it. After that, uh, we spoke to many industry analysts and uh, our customers and got feedback. And currently, uh, the uh, manifesto is uh, 0.85. And we are in the process of uh, making it 1.0. And one reason why we didn't uh, make it 1.0, we want to get more feedback. Probably after this conference, we are planning to release the Wonderful version. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce the panel. Uh, so uh, uh, first, uh, Kristen Pruitt. She's the Assistant Vice President, Information Technology at uh, Picking Insurance. And before that, uh, she used to work for State Farm for more than 21 years, a veteran in uh, insurance uh, industry. And uh, And we are working on a large integration project with Kristen very closely. Uh, the next uh, panelist is Prakash Ayer. Uh, so he is the uh, Chief uh, Information Innovation Officer at InnoMedia. Uh, before that, he used to be the uh, SVP of uh, Software Platform Architecture at Trimble. Uh, so in addition to the uh, business relationship we have, um, he is a really good friend. So he might give me a call. One day he gave me a call and asked, hey, how can I find uh, pandan leaves? I'm making an Asian curry. And, uh, and he's a mentor for me. Thanks for that, Prakash. Uh, and our third uh, panelist is uh, Isabel Moni. And she's the co-founder and founding CTO at 42 Crunch, a technology company focusing on API security. Um, before that, uh, she used to work for WSO2. Uh, she's a colleague. And uh, she ran the product strategy and product management for us for a, a long time. Even after she left, uh, we had a close relationship that we bump into each other uh, in uh, many industry events and discuss many stuff. Uh, then our uh, Next uh, panelist is Dinesh Kumar. Uh, he is uh, head of enterprise uh, digital solutions for Tech Mahindra. Uh, so he's working with uh, many uh, 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 organizations on large uh, digital transformation projects. Welcome, Dinesh. And uh, the next panelist is Vinay Hedge. He's the head of sales, low code, and integration at LTI Mindtree, uh, one of the premier partners for uh, WSO2. So welcome, everyone. So even though I'm the uh, I'm a co-author of Platformless, I'm going to moderate it and let the uh, our great uh, panelists to contribute to this discussion. So uh, to start the conversation, um, I think. Uh, you heard about uh, Platformless from Sanjeeva, and then I think uh, you read about uh, read the manifesto. So I would like to ask, what's your first reaction by hearing this concept? Uh, so I'll start with uh, Kristen. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's hard to s <laughs> see into the audience. Possible right to see. Um, so yeah, anything that promises radical simplification a better developer experience and a way to be more efficient and cost effective got my attention. <laughs> so um, I thought it was great, and I think it's a great idea and concept. Great. Uh, Prakash? 
Yeah, uh, first of all, I thank you for inviting me here. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be, uh, I was there on the first WSU conference and up to now uh, attended many, so this is great, thank you. And um, so my first reaction was, um, is so, so I only read the, the, the title, Platform Less, and I said, oh God, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I've been pitching about platform all along in all the companies that I worked for and sold it to the CFOs and CEOs to spend money to build a platform. Now they're saying there's no platform. So, uh, but, but as I read through it, um, I, I shared the same kind of feeling that, because I, I remember the biggest um, resistance I got was, we are not in the platform business, why are we building a platform? Uh, and that's one of the reasons um, where, where I did this um, many years ago, we used WSO2 as the sort of underlying platform. So we took WSO2, bundled it, um, about 90% of WSO2 as a, pr a platform for the, for the company. Um, the biggest, biggest uh, objections I got in those days was, look, we are not in the platform business, so what do we want to do? Do it quickly and get out of the way so we can build application. So I read through the paper, uh, I said, you know, hey, that, that the exact same thing that uh, this talks about, so it, it, it's definitely going to uh, make it a lot easier for people to build and focus on the real return on investment for the company. So. Great. It's a bit. Indeed, um, to, to build on, on, on what you just said, I'm going to tell a story of a customer actually met at a conference. We met as well at API World last year. Um, what we do at Fortito Crunch is really about um, how do you inject security as early as possible in, in the life cycle of APIs. And usually, the way you do this is you have to make sure you can inject some tests across every API you build, and it's not, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Except for this gentleman that just tells me, sure, no problem, we'll put it there. I'm like, how are you going to do that? So, well, we've spent the last two years building a platform for all our developers. We're talking a very large company. They have hundreds of developers, hundreds of systems, and they got the luxury, because I think it's a luxury, to given the time, the money, the resources, to build an entire platform where basically, as a developer, you come, you say, I want to build a REST service. It needs to talk to this, this, and that. Um, I use GitHub and go. And behind the scenes, magic happens, as we were talking this morning about Doc Martyr and energy. And out of that magic, um, the developers, they get an entire environment running to deploy. They get um, something they can install in their IDEs to work with. Um, they get the code with all the templates generated in GitHub. And all they have to worry about is write the code. And I thought it was like the perfect illustration of what we're trying to do, basically. It's uh, Dinesh. Yeah, so where I come from being a part of a GSI, right? So I have two views. One is from, as a GSI, obviously a platformless environment is definitely good because, you know, though we do ourselves a lot of platforms, but this will enable us to serve the customer. From the customer perspective, I think uh, it will take some time, primarily because there is going to be a maturity level of the customer which will determine where it will go. But at the same time, I think uh, certain customers who doesn't have that kind of a maturity level, they would just welcome this, basically. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I, I think I come from, a, a, let's say, a digital transformation for an application build-out point of view. Uh, these days, I mean, the application build-out time is reducing, right, with low-code applications and things like that. And uh, many a time in digital uh, transformation, the integration becomes the bottleneck. And uh, from what I've heard uh, on, on Corio and what I've seen, uh, it, it brings an immense opportunity uh, to kind of not just decouple the developer activities from platform operations and delivery, but also bringing the business uh, that opportunity to kind of uh, turn around the application, build out faster, quicker, and more efficient. So looking forward to that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so during Sanjeeva's keynote, Sanjeev explained that uh, without a platform, you can't get a platformless experience. And everybody's building platforms. And I'm in the CTO club in the Bay Area, and everybody's speaking about 
uh, how they architect the platform, how they are building the platform. And I'm sure most of you are involved in uh, this platform building. So any kind of challenges and any ghost stories <laughs> that you can share with the audience about building platforms and uh, how that journey is going on? Uh, probably, Prakash, you can give us oh, that. Okay. <laughs> Um, there are several ghost stories, so where do I start? Um, so um, if I go back to, again, the, the first uh, experience of building platform, working with uh, Sanka Yu and the WSO2 team, um, the, there are two things that come to my mind. My first uh, ghost story is not actually about um, building the actual platform. It was, it was more about um, how do you get across that message to people um, and especially if you're not in, in the business, in the, in the business of building tools or productivity tools or um, engineers, uh, development environment, that kind of business, you're in actually uh, in a business that you deliver some value to the end customer, your role is to focus on the applications. Uh, the same thing that, uh, that uh, 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 we talked about in, in the, in the uh, keynote. Um, so the, my, my biggest challenge there was, how do I articulate that to the people? Because um, this company had a uh, really bad experience about platform um, in, from the monolithic uh, old days, uh, because the platform used to be a drag for innovating new solutions, because you had to bring the platform up to date to run the new features, so that used to be always. So in that environment, um, building a platform, uh, yet, um, we realized that it was essential, uh, at least some of those people in the team who, who understood the value of this, realized that we need to build a platform to build our future cloud applications, um, rather than doing these things every time. And some of the things that you talk about, the native, um, you know, cloud native middleware um, components. So, the, so that was the, the, the big challenge um, to get it done, uh, to see how to prove the ROI. And the ROI was never there in the first application. The ROI starts building up in the second and the third and the fourth application. So, so that, was, that was a challenge. Um, so uh, I have some, some uh, scars, tissues, uh, still not fully healed on that one. And the second one um, was we had this vision of building a core platform layer and a business platform layer. So our vision was we'll have a core platform uh, that was uh, sort of uh, neutral to the, the domains that we were in, uh, and then an individual um, domain-specific business platform on top of that. Um, so for various reasons, I did not, I underestimate the challenge of building that second layer, because you need tremendous uh, cooperation from the business side of uh, the company for that. So, um, so I have some um, sort of ghost stories that was not fully realized. Uh, during my time, it later on uh, came to be, and it's, it's flourishing now, but, um, but those are the two that I can think of. Rich, uh, yeah, it's done anything? That. Yeah, so sometimes you don't realize that you're going to have a ghost story, so we're right in the thick of a really huge, actually, WSO2 migration, and so Pekin historically has outsourced to vendors a lot of their platform build work. So in this case, the migration from our current platform was done by a vendor. The knowledge was not retained by the employees. And so we hit a lot of bumps or ghost stories as we're doing our current migration in terms of lack of documentation, lack of knowledge, um, lack of knowing how to test. And so um, sometimes you hit a ghost story that you don't know you're going to hit because it was from previous decisions. Um, and then you just kind of work through that. And additionally, um, from a platform building perspective, a lot of times I think not really truly understanding the requirements um, of the people who are gonna use your platform and having strong communication will also be difficulties that you can encounter. Anyone else? Uh, can I if I just add, a, you know, I, I put the security angle and everything I say, <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Um, but it, just to give you an example, maybe of taking it the other way around on what are the benefits of, of creating a platform, right? One of the, um, you know, you, I'm sure you hear about breaches and security problems all day long. 
Um, one of the key problems we've seen with most of our customers is, is, you know, A, knowing something happened, but B, being able to do some forensics on what happened, you know, and, and get some traceability uh, across the system of, you know, where do people get in, how do they navigate through the system. If you're writing some code as a developer, one of the key things you would need to worry about um, is writing some events, some critical events, um, so that I'm not talking about debugging here. I'm really talking about being in production and writing some key events of login and key changes, et cetera, that can go somewhere. So then you can do some forensics uh, and knowing what happened. Now, if you want to do this with three developers in a small company, you can give them a library and off it goes, right? If you want to do this at scale across a lot of code in different languages, et cetera, you'll have to abstract this so that every single person writes the same event format. That's the main key. Like, everybody has to do the same thing. Otherwise, when you're going to try to put all of that together in a big pot and see what it says, it's going to be meaningless. That's one of the key advantages of having such a service in the platform, so that the developer don't have to think. They know that they write that line, you know, one line of instruction in their code. It will go behind the scenes in a certain format. And they don't have to worry about it. Right? Again, it's about facilitating. So I think we're going to talk about developer experience, right? Facilitating the developer experience. They don't have to think. They just need to write that line. And the, again, the magic underneath will happen. Yeah, that's one example. Just, to, yeah. just to add to what this guy said, as a tech Mahindra, I would say that, see, building platform is not just, I mean, obviously, whatever you said it makes true, but it's more about mind share. The mm -hmm. developer need to understand that when you're developing a platform, the mind share needs to be different from just writing an application, right? So it takes an entirely different uh, th level of thought when you're developing a platform. And that kind of a developer or a, you know, resources, if I want to call it as, is limited, right? And if platformless can make that easier, I think that's definitely a value add, basically. I'll just add to that. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, at LTI Mindtree, I mean, we are sub working for an India government project where we're supporting yeah. millions of transactions. And uh, it's not, I mean, you know, the, the platform like, uh, or platform less uh, offering like Curio brings a lot of, uh, uh, you know, speed, agility, and everything. But what we need to do when we are doing a digital transformation project, we need to look at the the wider ecosystem as well, the the front end system, the back end system, the the scaling. So they all need to come together. So from an overall perspective, uh, the success relies in the entire ecosystem moving, you know, at the same pace. Yeah. That's something that I want to highlight. Yeah. Thanks. So one thing uh, we identified while like working with many customers, helping them to architect platforms as well as building platforms, that some organizations, they are treating platform as a project with a fixed budget and a fixed timeline. Mm. But we think uh, it shouldn't be that way. It has to be a product because uh, technology is changing and then the business requirements are changing. With that, you need to keep on updating the platform. So uh, you can agree, disagree with that, but uh, I would like to get some insight uh, from you about treating platform as a product, and uh, is that happening in the industry? Um, and uh, how you see that uh, from a customer's point of view? Shall I go? Yeah, sure. So uh, within Tech Mahindra, we actually have a lot of product platform, I would say, which we have an IP for. For example, we have a Blue Marble. I think WSO2 works very closely with Blue Marble, which is our telco product. Uh, we have Comviva, which is a subsidiary platform company itself. Uh, then we have Warranties, which is a platform product on uh, Pega. Uh, so coming back to your point, so we do have a maturity level to build a platform, being a GSI, right? Uh, whether it is a project or a uh, Product, I certainly believe it can't be a project. Maybe one of the versions that you're developing can be a project. Uh, but being a GSI, sometimes we also look at it, how can we monetize it, right? So this acts as a uh, differentiator, and we in turn use it as to win the businesses. From a customer perspective, the way I see is that uh, definitely a platform is a product, because they do it more for simplifying the processes that they're talking about, right? Not so much of monetization, basically. 
So definitely they will keep on adding versions to it, and it needs, it generally runs into one, two, sometimes three years kind of a project, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, anyone else can contribute? Yeah, I mean, I can share. Okay. Um, we treat all of our IT capabilities in our department as products. So our platforms are no different than that. Uh, so we, tr you know, we care for them, understand the customer's needs um, from inception to sunset. I will say, though, for large efforts like our WSO2 migration, there are times when we pull out the, the trusty <laughs> project manager skill set to you know, have schedules and really manage those things. But overall, we treat our platforms like products. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think in applications, we, we use the same concept. I mean, the minimum viable product, get the product quick. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, the same concept would apply here as well. I mean, you know, you may just want to uh, containerize the APIs to start with, right? So you don't have to kind of boil the ocean. So it's always a product-based approach which kind of pays off uh, in, in such situ situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, so let's move from platform to platform less now. <laughs> and if you read the uh, uh, manifesto, uh, so the platform engineering is the foundation because platform engineering is the practice that building the platform. Uh, so I would like to go to Dinesh uh, and uh, ask about what's the maturity of the platform engineering in the industry and um, uh, whether we have enough skills to like truly operate um, in a platform engineering manner as well as whether platform engineering is delivering what the business is expecting? Uh, it's a very good question. So let me take a step back uh, to answer this question. Basically, obviously, when we talk about uh, platform engineering, right, you are talking about many aspects to it. Uh, if I take certain industry uh, customers that we deal with, right, uh, let's say retail, banking, uh, telco, uh, there is elements where they are talking about vendor, they are talking about licensing, and you are talking about certain deployment challenges in the platform engineering. Uh, certain sector of customers, okay, like telco for that matter, they do have expertise and skills which can handle it, and some of our customers have done it very well. Uh, however, there are certain, uh, I would say, uh, new niche-based organizations who are whose core focus may not be so much on a technology, but because their core business is somewhere else, they certainly see this platform less as a boon, because they believe that this is something which I don't want to take care of, this is something which I can easily add it. However, I think the, uh, I think the value add is something which will come over a later period of time. I think that's when it will catch up, basically. Great. Yeah, so now the platform engineering is the foundation, and then uh, we have three pillars on top of that in the platformless concept. The first one is API first. Yes. Uh, so, Isabel, I'll come to you because you are the uh, API expert in this panel. So, uh, uh, so how it connects to platformless and um, uh, how an organization can uh, get into the API first approach because it's a concept, but and I think it's a, a, a kind of a um, mindset as well. Uh, be platform, uh, sorry, API first. Uh, so uh, any any uh, uh, insight into that, how API first fit into this and why it is important for uh, the organization? Sure. Um, okay, what is API first to start with, right? Uh, the, the idea is we're starting by defining what the interactions, and what's the contract between whatever we're going to consume and the producer of that information or process or whatever it is. The idea is to start with defining what that interaction is going to be, even we may not have any, any code behind it. So obviously, we're all you know, enterprises here. We have an existing. Uh, plenty of systems that already run that have not been written this way, that have been written in code and then documented. Um, but the key advantage for me, and this is really taking, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the Open API. You, you may know this as Swagger. You know, I guess we're going to really didn't work well, the renaming here. But um, so Swagger Open API, maybe now we have Async API. What is this? It's a way of describing what the API actually does. When all this started, um, it really was only used for documentation. That was really the goal. So that if you had an API portal, like people could know how to actually use your API. 
But there's so much more to it right now that's really fueling that API first movement, which is, OK, I'm defining my APIs. Um, I'm part of my business unit. Some other people are going to write the front end. Great. So I can define that. And then without any you know, further ado, as a client of that API, I can already generate some skeleton, some client code. I can generate mockups. Uh, so I can see how the API is actually working while the backend guy is actually writing the code that's going to do the real thing. So why is this so important in, in, in the platform? Because in the end, everything is an API. When, when we write applications today in, in, on the top of our platform, what do we do? We create APIs and we create systems that allow us to connect them together, transform the data and you know, all the things we do in Ballerina, Corio, et cetera. Um, and, and it's, it's fundamental, I think, to the approach, because if you can do all those components, I have a very clear view that on top of my platform, this is all the things I can play with, I can use to create new applications. Um, that's how you're going to get that agility, that um, productivity, which I think is very important in all this. How do we make development more productive? and have some code. So yeah, start with the APIs, start them by defining them, create that catalog, create some mockups, uh, create your applications, and then bring in also the old stuff, <laughs> right? We've been writing for 20 years, bring that in there, because we're not going to rewrite them, we're not going to tear them away. But if we are bringing them under the same umbrella of documenting them in the same way, then we don't care if it was written 20 years ago or you know, one month ago, we can all take them and bring them all together. Yeah. yeah. Great. And I would ask, I would like to ask one more question on the API side. Uh, I don't know whether you read this paper. There was a recent uh, conversation about API management is dead, and um, <laughs> API management is part of uh, platform engineering. Yes. Yeah. It's part of platform. Sorry, it's part of the uh, platform. platform. Um, but uh, what's your uh, kind of uh, Reaction on that? Well, I, you know, I think that phrase is coming from. So when, when we started the API management, right? I, I did this in 2012. So when we started this, yeah, so, yeah, so true, right? um, there's really two parts to it. There's the governance aspect, which I think is the part that belongs into the platforms. It's that catalog I was talking about. Yeah. And there's the runtime part, so the gateways, right? So the gateways are becoming a commodity. Um, there's like all this work which is being done as real right now to have a, a common front on top of all the gateways. So I, I have many customers that have two, three different API management, API gateways, um, and that they have to make work all together, right? So I, I think it's API management as, a, as a, maybe as a single thing is being redefined and separated into the runtime aspect of it and the governance aspect of it. That's kind of control plane, data plane, right? That, that's kind of the way I see it in the evolution of that market. Great. Yeah, yeah so the second pillar of uh, platformless is about cloud native middleware. Mm -hmm. And even we were debating uh, what we call that pillar, and we stick to cloud native middleware. I think uh, people don't like the term middleware, but we still believe middleware is very important. And yes, middleware is disappearing into code and infrastructure with uh, the latest uh, uh, technology movement. But still, it's really important. Uh, I, Prakash, you are you are working on um, this middleware stack for a long time. Yes. And I yes. think so. Uh, um, so you, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, middleware, unfortunately, has got a bad connotation. Um, in the very early days, you know, we used to have. Uh, and the object databases came. There was middleware for object to relational, all kinds of, and it used to be a fad. And, and to, to, to today, if you go to Silicon Valley, where I come from, um, if a startup starts saying, I'm building a middleware, you wouldn't get funded. Um, <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, that's the thing. But yet, what I've seen is every time the technology evolution happens, that, there comes a time when middleware is necessary. Right, and, and you're right, if over a period of time, some part of the middleware might go uh, get absorbed into some layers, but the importance of middleware, I mean, let's think about what is cloud-native middleware, right? The, that's the sort of essential, all of the different pieces that are together make it, uh, help us build a scalable, reliable um, cloud application, right? So that need is not gonna go away. Um, it, it may take different shape, um, but I think it's important that in, in the current situation that the platform provide that for the application developers so that 
the middleware become the, the, the part that they don't have to worry about, you know, so that does the job for them. So yeah. that's one view. <laughs> yeah. My view there. Yeah. So I think the, the, uh, the third pillar is about the developers, and um, uh, the developers are the craftsmen of the uh, uh, digital experience creation, right? And uh, if the platform doesn't provide enough uh, developer experience, it's going to be an issue. And we have seen that's happening in some of the organizations as well, that it's going back to this shadow IT type of a concept that people building stuff outside the platform because it doesn't provide um, uh, what the developers are looking for. And another danger is if the uh, developers, they have to go to the platform engineering and then request for certain things, um, then it's going to block uh, the productivity and how fast they can deliver these digital experiences. So I think the, that's where the, um, uh, uh, the developer experience is coming and playing a role. So Kristen, I think you are working with developers really closely, uh, so I think uh, you can provide some insight uh, on uh, um, developer experience side. I mean, I will say that our developers are spending too much time on platform engineering tasks. Um, you know, we're very, I would say, low in our maturity, um, but I'm very hopeful about the idea of platformless and mm -hmm. the idea of really focusing in on the developer experiences and making it um, easy for the developers to do the right thing quickly, efficiently, so we can meet our business outcomes, because that's really why we do this. Great. Yeah. So I'd like to go to Vinay, since you are working on these digital transformation projects, uh, a concept like platformless, how you can like, um, get organizations to adopt it and then uh, implement inside the organizations? Any strategy that you can share uh, from uh, your point of view? Yeah, I think... Um uh, see, there are there are challenges, and 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 as Prakash mentioned, the the importance of middleware. I mean, what we see is like in many of the large-scale digital transformation initiatives, as I said earlier, uh, you know, integrations and the uh, the middleware becomes the you know, in many cases, the stumbling block. So now, uh, how do we take the advantage? How do we use this as an opportunity, right? So there is API-first approach, a cloud native, and the developer developer experience. How can you bring that, uh, you know, to the enterprise-wide transformation? Uh, you know, most of the enterprise are moving in federated way uh, of, of structuring themselves. Uh, you know, there is the balance that you need to draw between, you know, how, how much you can reuse across different lines of businesses while keeping the federation going. So what, a, you know, the concept like Corio brings is, you know, it, 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 it gives you all the levers to, um, explore and exploit that in your digital transformation journey. How do you organize that in your enterprise with your you know, wider uh, transformation journey? It's, it's what it's going to be critical uh, to bring to the bear. Great. Yeah. It's a bit I mean, yeah, because um, I'm very passionate about developer experience because <laughs> in my field of security, that's kind of the key point is like we're asking developers more and more and more to do, right? And in and, and my field, my key problem is how do I balance uh, being able to push some security testing, et cetera, in, into the everyday life of a developer without affecting their productivity? Or, and, and back to what you were saying about building the platform, uh, I think what's really critical here is indeed you have to think of the developers as your customer. And indeed, if you don't, if you build something that is not, that's going to get in their way, right? In terms of doing what they have to do, which is delivering to the business, it's not going to work. It, you're going to do this for nothing because they'll go around it, and then you you would have made that investment, which is probably not a small investment either, you know, in in, in money or effort, um, without reaching your your goals really. You know, so that that will, you know tip of the iceberg almost, which is what the developers will see is, is so critical um, and should be the main focus of, of building something like this or the main focus of, a, you know, that I've seen of, of something like Korea of like, okay, this is my world, that's where I live, that's where I work, um, don't take me out of there and, and give me all the services I need to be as efficient as possible. Yeah, I think the flow efficiency, right, like the wait time versus the actual productive 
time. Uh, so business, I think they should uh, look at that and then uh, uh, look at why the developer experience and then the productivity is really important because in most cases, the wait time is really high. Like they are waiting to create a database, they are waiting to get the CI, CD yeah. stuff done. And even uh, to start uh, development, they, it takes a lot of time because how they can get into the, uh, the corporate pipeline and then write standard code. So those are the uh, challenges I think uh, uh, the business should focus on. So the, before we open up for questions, I think uh, the last question that I would, I would like to ask now, the specification or the manifesto is 8.85. Uh, uh, so um, anything that you think uh, we should include or improve in the specification uh, to make it uh, one or two. Uh, so I'll start with you, Prakash, since you provided some sure. back, uh, <laughs> as well. Why not? Uh, I'm sure you're going to open it up, and, and I'm sure the, the people out there will have much better suggestions. But, I, but I'm going to do a, a, a couple of them, a couple of one that comes to my mind. Um, one is that I think at a better articulation, it, it, it's an easy concept to understand, as I said, if you, if you leave, leave aside the title and uh, go into the body of the, the paper, you can really understand the parallel between server to serverless and that, what that did to people, uh, help the developers a uh, much better way of creating applications, so going from platform to platform. That's an easy part. Um, but in terms of for those people out there who are trying to, the, the, who understood but yet have to articulate this um, to their powers be, or the CFOs or CEOs, uh, a better way of putting the ROI. Why should I go into power platform less? Uh, the same thing I had to do um, when I was uh, you know, pushing the platform concept, um, what's the ROI in it? I think that would be a good one um, if, if you could include a bit of that. Um, the other thing is I think I see this as I think through and I, I read through that paper was, this is very similar to what um, metadata did to databases. You know, you're, not, you're not focusing on the metadata, but you're focusing on the data. But yet, it's the metadata that lets you manage the data better. So this is a meta platform in, a, in many ways to me. So, um, so I'm always looking for simpler ways to articulate things so that people at different way, uh, levels can understand this. Um, so I think those are, those are my, my sets. <laughs> Uh, Eastern, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I would just say that in terms of what the product right now has it, um, I can certainly say one thing I would request Sanjeeva and the team not to include is because the platformless is already taking away a lot of the work from the DevOps and other platform engineering. But if they include an Gen AI into this, I don't think then developers have anything else to do. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a humble request, I would say, from a developer community perspective. But yes, I think to a large extent, I think it is certainly good. Uh, the two uh, point of discussion that generally comes when we talk to the customer is more in terms of uh, the security. I think you talked about it. Uh, secondly, I think certain customers still want to move from on-premise to cloud, right? And then you're talking about the hybrid environment. So I may be wrong, I just want to know, is the platform courier there in terms of hybrid? How does it handle, basically? Yeah, the initial, so there's this concept called AI augmented uh, software engineering. Yeah. So that's where like, we are even looking at from platform less concept-wise plus uh, courier as a implementation uh, there to deliver uh, and connect AI and uh, use it to increase the productivity of the developers. Uh, so even in my workstation, I have uh, three monitors. One is running uh, some AI stuff because it's a helper, right? You can use it. I think every developer can use it as a helper and then be productive. So I think well, I, hope, I hope it stays still there. <laughs> <laughs> but those are evolving and we yeah. carefully look at it and get the good stuff. Uh, yeah into the platform. I think with that, we can open uh, for questions. Uh, uh, if anybody is having questions, uh, uh, the panel can answer. <laughs> I can't really see you. So. They're all hungry, I think. Time for food. Well, they can see us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question to Isabel. Ah, um, OK. OK. Free for talking. <laughs> uh, it's a question about API security. Sure. Uh, so you're talking about the API security perspectives, the API governance versus API runtime. Uh, 
which is the preference one, which is the from API developer's perspective, uh, which is the preference one, you have to follow the API security only governance or runtime, or you cannot have both. But if, if for runtime, um, the API gateway should be integrate that, uh, the API security. Um, okay, so there's, there's really two parts to this from, for me. There's, there's um, what you do before, as you know, it's, it's not enough basically to just do either just runtime, which would be putting, you know, um, web application firewalls, and I'm talking about threat protection here, right, at, at a higher level. So runtime protection is one thing, but it, or you know, there's a lot of AI-based solutions right now as well of discovering that maybe we have a problem, right? So yes, it's going to give you some highlights and tell you here you may have a problem, et cetera, but you haven't fixed anything. So my, my goal is more to say, OK, from a, run, from a governance and from a development perspective, what if we could just find those problems way earlier and fix them? We'll still need the runtime because, you know, in security you need 10 key. You know, you need to close down everything at runtime, but you also need to prevent. So this, this is what you're going to hear about in security as shift left and shield right, right? So you want to shift left finding issues and you want to shield your system from a runtime perspective to prevent those attacks. Now, um, if you had to invest in a single place, I would start with the prevent, frankly, right? Because it's really going to be something that's going to pay very much in the long run, you know. And then, you know, and you can do the, the runtime part as well. I hope I answered your, your, your question. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, we can take one more question. We are running out of time. All right. Um, Great insights from the panel. Thank you. Um, I want to start with something that Prakash said, which is we need to have a better way to articulate the business value to the CFO, the CEOs, yeah. and try to fund these Absolutely. particular things. And so to that regard, I know, uh, Kristen, you have uh, an active um, migration effort happening. Are you already putting things in place to measure the developer productivity benefits that you're getting? Uh, moving on to WSO2, using Corio. Um, the same question to um, Vinay and Dinesh also. Like, are you doing these things with the customers? Because inevitably, the executives are going to ask, why should I care? Mm -hmm. Net, right? Mm -hmm. So let, oh, let me take that question. Um, so yeah, certainly uh, when we have this discussion with the customer, right, and this point does come up saying, end of the day, what's an ROI for our customer, right? Because this discussion happens either at a, so if you're engaging at a CIO below level, they do definitely don't like it because they know that, okay, it's going to take away some of their uh, tasks that they are doing it. Uh, there, there could be a resistance. But if you're engaging at a, a little bit senior level, uh, so there is definitely an ROI that comes down to. Uh, while it may be great for a developer, but they don't take a decision. It's always somebody at the C level who takes a decision or even at the board level, right? So my answer always has been, okay, uh, look at what, are the, what is the current cost that they are incurring, either in terms of vendor, in terms of licensing, in terms of the resources that they have. And uh, what is that? So I don't think there's a ready-made ROI, but we do try to engage with WSO2. And we do it on a case-to-case -case basis, and then we look at the uh, pros and cons, is how we put it. I think I think uh, extending on that point, it, it all depends on uh, who are you articulating the value to. It's the technology organization or the business, right? right. So I think from for that perspective, what Prakash mentioned, the value articulation becomes extremely important when there is a paradigm change in in a concept like platformless, uh, you know, uh, element here. Uh, and and I think at, at the end of the day, it all boils down to uh, for the business, are you doing things quicker, time to market? Uh, cost takeout, cost efficiency there, uh, or, the, or the enhancing the, the customer experience, right? So uh, from, from that perspective, I mean, if you are able to articulate how, uh, a, you know, platformless concept ultimately, you know, provides those values, I think that's what the customers are, uh, you know, wanting to hear and make the decisions based on. Yeah. 
Uh, Prakash, you can give a quick answer since the question came to you. I'm sorry? Yeah, you can give a quick answer. Oh, I, th I thought Krishna wanted to say something. No, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, everything that uh, uh, both my fellow panelists talked about here. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to point out. Um, uh, Sanjeeva talked about ecosystem, the value of ecosystem. And I think people have not, um, he's always ahead of time, so uh, people have not realized the value of it yet. Um, because uh, the, the thing is that the ecosystem platform, that's what I call the business platform, um, it, it's, it's what really adds value to your business. We've gone at the days when Nike could just build one shoes and say, you know, we don't need anybody, we can market it and build an empire. You, you have to rely on the ecosystem. And every business is realizing that. So I think what the platformless concept also uh, gives is an easier way for people to build the ecosystem platforms. So, and, and you can't do that, and, and a technology company cannot do that. The reason being, you don't understand their business. So the retail ecosystem platform is different from the construction, from, different from the agriculture platform. So making uh, companies facilitating e build, to build this ecosystem platform through the presence of platformless layer, um, I think that's, an, that's a value articulation that will get the ROI to a CFO or the CEO better. I think we have to conclude the panel since we are running out of time. I knew this will happen, okay. so I know you guys. Uh, so thank you very much, and I think uh, you enjoy the panel discussion, and thank you very much for joining the panel. Thanks. 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 Thanks.